My current project, um, Emerging Asian Megacities, is a trans-national, uh, trans-regional project. Um, and I'm going to focus today on two of the cities that I have visited. Um, Delhi, as you see here. Um, this is a metro stop with cow eating trash. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, summing up in my mind at least some of the complexities of um, the rapid urban changes that are happening in megacities today. Um, and the other city is uh, Karachi. So how did it begin? Um, I was working on, for research on this book, Art in the Global Economy. Um, and I did a quick trip to uh, the cities of Shanghai to see the Shanghai Biennial, the 2012 Shanghai Biennial, it was early 2013, and then to Delhi to see the uh, Indie Art Fair shortly thereafter. And in order to go, I did a little research about these cities and discovered, much to my surprise, that both of them were the largest cities in their respective countries. I'd always thought it was Beijing and Mumbai. Um, and what I found uh, further is that these cities were growing very quickly. And uh, to my eye, it was uh, fascinating because uh, these photos notwithstanding, Shanghai seemed to be entirely vertical and Delhi entirely horizontal. Um, and uh, it was fascinating to me that two cities could be becoming megacities, these cities of you know, around 20 to 25 million people, depending on how you measure it, um, and growing in such totally different ways. But what was interesting to me is how much creative energy these places have. And I started to plan an exhibition project around that. Um, I've been working with Corinne, talking to her about this for a long time. Um, and uh, after visiting a couple of cities, it's, it's sort of taken on a life of its own. Um, what I should tell you is that I was a curator for 10 years before I became a professor of international studies. Um, and so you could say I'm a recovering curator, and every time I have a project idea, I'm like, oh, this would make a great show. <laughs> so um, that's kind of uh, where I'm at. But I'm also thinking as a social scientist uh, more and more these days, and um, trying to uh, come to terms with what a megacity is was something that was really difficult for me. Now, of course, we know about the, the megacities such as uh, Tokyo and Seoul and Hong Kong, um, but I'm focusing on uh, another generation of cities that are growing very rapidly um, and are becoming you know, huge uh, transnational hubs. Uh, so the four cities besides, the two besides Delhi and Karachi are Jakarta, where I will visit over the winter break, and uh, Shanghai, I'll be going back. Um, I'm interested in the problem of, you know, you see here some world uh, build-up areas, largest populations, and the numbers are just staggering, right? Almost 40 million people in Tokyo. But you see Jakarta is really not that far behind, running around 32, 33. So here you have a, a map that sort of explains a little bit of what I'm looking at. Here is the actual city, right? This is a, a, a generic city. This is none of my cities. Um, here is the sort of urban agglomeration. And then here is the metropolitan area. What we're finding with megacities is that the, these distinctions mean less and less, right? And that the megacity is a kind of urbanization of this entire area. And it probably grows out beyond the red line. Right? And, and that is because uh, these cities are experiencing rapid population expansion. Right? This is a, another um, UN image um, showing uh, us uh, how the megacities are going to grow. This is something that I've been fascinated with because if you look at the areas that are in red, you see highly urbanized areas already. Right? The areas in blue are the least urbanized areas. And so you see China and India here at 29, or 42 and 29 percent, respectively, though they have the largest urban areas in the world, right? um, because of course the largest populations, they are nevertheless some of the least urbanized places, which means what we're going to see in the years up to 2050 is an incredible acceleration of urbanization in those places. Right? And so um, uh, needless to say, Pakistan's on this list as well as Indonesia's you know, at 50 percent. So they're a little bit higher. But what we're looking at are places that are not very urbanized and are going to be urbanized very rapidly. Right? So they've already been urbanized rapidly, and it's changing even faster. And here's an image of you know, mega cities uh, in 1970. You can see there's a handful of these red dots. They've expanded considerably by 2014. And by 2030, the world is brimming with them. Right? And so for me, this is a question about our collective future. Where are we headed? What, what's going on here? And how is that going to change uh, the global uh, world as we know it? Being an art historian by training and a curator by uh, former profession, I, of course, want to look at what artists are doing and how artists are internalizing and expressing these ideas. So on a trip to 26, in 2016 to Karachi, thanks very much to my friend 
Kamar Adamji in the audience who um, uh, played host and uh, you know went around and visited many artists and, and institutions with myself. Um, uh, this is an image of Karachi, the city, uh, railroad tracks near the center of town. Um, you see a kind of mix of urban uh, phenomenon here, you know, sort of industrial buildings, rail, transportation, squatter settlements, right? This is a, a, an interpretive um, work done by Rui Ahmed, who um, tried to make a series of maps of the city, right? Talking about her voyage, her own personal voyage across the city. This up here where she lives, this down here where she works. Right? Um, and uh, this is the most direct route that she can go to get to where she is, but there's four different maps and the route becomes more and more circuitous as more things block her path. Right? We're talking about bombings, violence, police shutting down the roads, the army moving in, um, and, and we're not talking about development. Right? So um, in some sense, this is a, a, an image of the disruptions felt and experienced by one person who maps them through artistic experience through artistic current means, right? Two other artists I had the opportunity to meet, Seema Nusrat and Munawar Ali Syed. Um, Seema is working with um, uh, sandbag barriers that many, um, you know, embassies for sure, but now more and more residences are putting in front of their houses. She's uh, playfully tongue in cheek, making a city out of the sandbag barriers. Um, uh, whereas Munawar has done this wonderful piece, Where Lies My Soul, where you see all this tracery lines and you know references to pop art, which is very much part of Karachi's history, right? But what we see is the intersecting lives of so many different domains of technology and human life in this mega city, you know, phenomenon, right? In my mind, this is a kind of image of the deep complexities that come with living in a megacity and trying to, in some ways, get some of that out in your artistic work, right? So this is one of the modalities that I discovered on my first trip to Karachi. Uh, this sort of psychogeography, as I called it, um, in an article that I recently published in Lotus Leaves. And then here, kind of um, engagements with public space, right? How do you intervene in these places? Um, Niza Khan did this early project, Henna Hands, and this is the piece that she actually made. I had a, a headed woman, female figure on a wall in an urban space that you can see is already filled with kind of visual vernacular. This is a piece of um, uh, sort of graffiti, but political graffiti, which has been partially painted over. Obviously, this is a barber shop and other uh, images of uh, the haircuts you can get. And it's existing in real space, right? She wanted to intervene to put the female body in the real space of Karachi. Um, and then this, the Walls of Karachi project, a broader public um, project, which was actually partially funded by USAID and, and Nausea would, uh, Niza would probably be mad that I'm putting these two slides side by side because she would not want to have anything to do with this sort of more general uh, public improvement kind of issue. And yet it engaged many, many artists um, uh, who worked throughout the city, bus painters and other kind of decorative artists, um, to you know, really do a kind of public engagement in the city. When I went to Delhi and I was there over the past summer, um, I discovered uh, a totally different level, if you will, of uh, how artists were engaging in the city. Um, there were new means and new forms of research that were being um, pioneered. And I want to focus, I have only so little time, I want to focus on three organizations um, that I discovered while I was there or that I knew about before, um, but I think should demonstrate the kind of alternatives that are emerging from this urban context. Partially it's India, yes, Partially, it's Delhi, the specificity, specificities of Delhi, but also artists engaging in public uh, in the city in, in ways that I hadn't anticipated or couldn't have fit into my previous rubric. Right? Um, the Samath Collective, founded in 1989, um, because of the death of this gentleman, Safdar Hashmi, um, who was a Muslim street artist performing uh, political theater in the street, and he was literally gunned down during one of his performances on New Year's Day. Um, this caused a huge upsurge in um, uh, concern and political activism among artists, right, who came together to form this organization, Samat, um, which is still run in the back of a, it's like the garage of the parliamentarian's house for this Communist Party um, uh, in, uh, in Delhi. And uh, there's a lot of different artistic organizations are, that have been part of this. There is a, a street theater day that they continue to do. But um, Vivin Sundaram has become very active with, has been very active with them, organizing artistic activities like public exhibitions on, you know, uh, plywood boards that they put out in public in, uh, in the city. Oh my gosh, I'm out of time. So I just want to, um, I would touch on Koj, but uh, I'm going to leave that because uh, 
as we know, um, Cho already spoke about Cho, which is an important, I think probably the world's most important artist collective, um, founded in Delhi, but very much engaging with the city around it. Um, but Sarai is the other organization that I wanted to just briefly mention. Um, uh, you saw Rocks Media Collective. They worked with two academics um, uh, in order to found this organization about uh, city technology and art, right? Um, and it was a very successful organization that was able to um, pioneer a, a couple of um, different projects and bring many resident fellows to the city. Um, all of these resident fellows were required to write, right? That was their obligation of their, um, of their fellowship, is that they had to go out and engage in the city and write about it. And so there's this incredible public archive. But also, um, what they did is to discover new forms of research that crossed the line between artistic and academic research and produced innovative projects, the kind of which don't readily fit into our art historical categories. This caused me to rethink the way I'm approaching creative activity in the city and to recognize that, at least in Delhi, new forms of engagement uh, between art and public have been discovered which have not come into existence, as far as I know, in the West. And this is, uh, I think, uh, speaks to the incredible vitality and uh, the incredible possibility, if you will, of the megacities in Asia today. So thank you.